There was a time when almost everyone had Nokias. At its peak in 2007, Nokia had a 51% market share of phones. That was when my guest for today, Kelvin Liu, joined Nokia, a company at its pinnacle. Today, we're going to talk about Nokia's rise and fall, what it felt like for the people working there during that journey, and analogies to companies in recent times. Welcome back to Investing in Darren. Click subscribe to stay updated to more interviews like this. Kelvin, thank you for joining us in the channel. Tell us more about yourself. Hi, I'm Kelvin Liu, and I'm firstly very honored for Darren to invite me on his uh, YouTube channel to share about my experiences and uh, any lessons that I've learned from working with Nokia for uh, five, five plus years. So about myself personally, I'm uh, Malaysian. I'm 39 this year. I'm married. I started my career in Nokia since I was a university student. So I started there as an intern and I worked towards uh, being an engineer there. And um, I think today will be a, a nice uh, reflection of what I have done uh, during my times there and also uh, to share about uh, how a company as big as Nokia at its time uh, to change into such a, a different form of its uh, former self in recent times. Let's start all the way from the beginning. So we rewind the clock back to the year 2008 when you first joined Nokia in Germany. Tell us about what was that experience like and share with the audience like what was the brand perception of Nokia then? Yes, I'll, I'll rewind a bit further back to 2006 or 2007, around that time. I started in uh, Germany. I was a university student and we have to do an internship in, uh, in the industry for uh, two semesters. So in my third semester, I started as an intern there uh, doing uh, machining jobs in their workshop. And at that time, Nokia was at its heydays. They were... Uh, making a lot of uh, very uh, great phones and great products for everyone. And at that time, the brand perception was amazing. Everyone loves Nokia. Um, the culture of uh, connecting people really resonated with a lot of the, the public. So uh, it, was, it was an honor to be able to work in such a famous uh, company, especially from uh, my... my humble country we in Malaysia, we do not have the chance to be working in, in, in the R&D and in very deep into the, the product. And in 2008, I did another half a year to, to finalize my uh, internship. And then after that, I continued to do my thesis also with Nokia. And at that moment, I started to realize that uh, simulations was uh, something that I love to do. So I applied for the job and I was accepted since I have the experience of working with Nokia in my student day. So I was also very honored for my manager to give me that opportunity. And in 2008 was when I officially graduated and my job started in October 2008. So as everyone knows, that was just right before or maybe a month in, in between the financial crisis in the US. Fortunately, it did not affect the mobile phone industry that much due to the fact that everyone was, uh, it was really booming at that time. Only the uh, car companies and the banks were having some trouble. So I was very fortunate to be able to secure such a great job at that uh, company. And from then on, I worked uh, as a mechanical simulations engineer to test and simulate the reliability of the uh, mobile phones until 2012, when they decided, when Nokia decided to uh, cease their operations in, uh, in our site in Germany. Tell us the audience a little bit more about this simulations uh, engineer. Because when we think about testing the reliability products, some of us watch the YouTube channel, Jerry Rig Everything, where he tries to scratch the phone, yes. bend them, pull them apart. What was your role like? 
Okay, my role was in the product development team. So uh, what I do is whenever there's a new design change or uh, there's a prototype built that needs verification before it goes into the, the uh, tooling, which means that when, before it goes into uh, manufacturing a real uh, product, we, the designers, we, I work closely with the designers. It's, my, my role is a bit interdisciplinary. I have to work with the PCB team. The, we call it the hardware team. Ironically, the PCB is called the hardware, but the casing, the covers, we call the mechanics team. So we, um, I work with both sites there. And I was, we also have a team which I work closely with the other simulation uh, uh, disciplines. For example, the, uh, the antenna, they do simulations. The audio, they do simulations. And the thermal, so they also do simulations. So I mean the mechanical simulations. So mm -hmm. I work closely with these people. And most of the time, I do uh, refining of the uh, design. And I run a simulation on our computers to test the reliability of the phone in the field. So our main objective, or rather our main, my main scope was in the drop test reliability. So as you know, that Nokia is very well known for being quite durable. And uh, the drop test can, uh, we hope to, to simulate that real, um, that real life performance on our computers before we, we go into um, manufacturing. And besides that, we also do um, twisting, bending, um, and a few other uh, reliability tests like uh, long-term performance. So we do uh, fatigue simulations and then we also, and, and after that I will correlate or I will work with the uh, real testing team. So we also do real testing, it's not just on the computers. So after the, the, the phones come back, I mean, after the phones were manufactured hmm. or maybe the prototypes were manufactured, then uh, we work closely with the uh, testing team to see if our results uh, have any improvements or if there are anything that is out of the ordinary and then I will refine our models as time goes on. That speaks to the testament to all the behind the scenes work that most of us don't see. When we picked up the Nokia 3310 back in our school days, using it, it was like a brick. You could drop it on the floor, it's fine. Back then, it was a world of also removable batteries. You remember a time yes. when the batteries in your phone could be removed. So it is really interesting hearing what goes on behind the scenes. And Kelvin talked about all the different people that he had to work with just to bring this to life. And working with people were working them eight hours a day, sometimes in launch months, 10, 12 hours a day. So culture matters a lot. Tell us a bit more about the culture at Nokia back then. The culture with uh, working in, with the people in Nokia was great. That is uh, without a doubt in my, in my opinion. I really loved working in Nokia at the time, despite the challenges that we have, because the people really uh, changed the, 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 the way of us uh, behaving and, and trying to be proud of our, our work. So I really loved the culture. We had uh, great uh, rapport within our teams. We, we challenge each other, but in a very professional way. And I really love the challenges that we were given to provide, to, to create a product that people really love and, and use daily. And I personally, I, I do miss that culture in, in Nokia. I think it's a testament to the, the Finnish culture where they uh, really take care of their employees. And in turn, after taking care of their employees, they, they, do, pro, they do create very great uh, work for the company and, the, and everyone that is involved. I can hear from your voice when you talk about culture, just almost like memories coming back and the, the joy that yeah. you experience. You worked in Nokia for five years. What changed and what didn't during your five years there? When I started, uh, Nokia was really in the pinnacle. They were selling phones, I think, every 11 seconds, if I'm not mistaken at the time. So it was really a very, um, I would say, a comfortable time for the company. In, in Germany, uh, my site was responsible for the middle range phones. So we did not, uh, we do not have, uh, or we rather in Germany, we did not 
uh, dabble too much into the smartphone uh, segment. Uh, that was in uh, Finland. However, we do uh, keep our keep our, keep us, we, we do up, keep up to date with the technology that is uh, being put into the, the high end segment because the technology will definitely trickle down <clears throat> into the, the mid range uh, sooner or later. I would say what didn't change at first, I mean, which I'm glad that they stayed was the culture among the people. I mean, everyone was uh, very motivated and everyone was uh, really loved their jobs and really wanted to, to be their best. Mm. Uh, what changed in the end was, I think the external factors was one of the really big uh, disruption that uh, affected the company. And definitely, as everyone know, the launch of the Apple iPhone at that time, which disrupted the whole industry, not only in, uh, not only Nokia. And of course, Nokia was affected the most since the, they were the, the, the market leaders at that time. Internally, there was also maybe some factors that affected, uh, that changed, where they changed the leadership to another, uh, another outsider. So that may have affected a bit of the morale of the employees. And I think at that time, the, the sentiment was that the employees had a little bit of mistrust on the direction that the management was going due to the external uh, disruption that Apple uh, caused at that time. So let's talk about Apple and the iPhone, and then we bring it back into what happened internally. So in your five years in Nokia, you've really seen a pretty big part of the iPhone life cycle from launch in 2007, all the way up to market leading stage around 2012. Yes. So can you walk us through when the iPhone initially launched, what was the reaction from Nokia? When the iPhone initially launched, uh, let me talk on the personal note first. When the iPhone initially launched, it was uh, to me, uh, I, to be honest, at that time, I did not feel that it would be a, a big thing because firstly, it was a very expensive product. It did not have the features that uh, Nokia had at the time. Uh, especially in the technology uh, segment. For example, it didn't have uh, the 4G. It did not have, uh, uh, I, don't th I think it didn't even do MMS mm. very well. And at that time, the, the, for me personally, I think that would not be uh, an issue because we know that our products are superior in, in different, different forms and we can, we, can, we can be better or we are actually better. On the company note, I think most of the companies share the same uh, sentiment as what I have, <clears throat> but they did not expect the fast pace of that innovation. They did not expect that the public would uh, be forgiving of the lack of a certain features. And they pushed through the really the impactful features to the customer first instead of um, going for features that only a certain group of people want to do. And for me personally, actually the only wow moment that I actually um, remembered from that first uh, keynote was uh, how Steve Jobs can pinch Zoom with two mm -hmm. fingers. That was, that was really amazing. I mean, uh, at that time, uh, Nokia was in the resistive touch so it, it was not doable on the software, but when, when he showed that, I mean, I think it resonated with the public very well. It's very human instead of uh, engineer, you know? So it, I think that, that Apple had that going for them. So very well done. It was like a magic show. Yeah. So for normal people like me, it was like magic. I imagine to the engineers, they were wondering what made it possible, what went on. And yes. back then, Nokia's operating system was Symbian. Can you tell us about your first time as a user seeing an iPhone in a while and actually touching it, using it? Sure. Um, I did not own an iPhone until 2019. After using the iPhone 7, I mean, I, I was converted. I was a MacBook user at, in uh, 2009. I was a MacBook user. 
So I understand the philosophy that Apple has. They really make things that people will, will feel comfortable using, I would say that. And it's not for just for the geeks or for people who are, you know, who are not so well-versed with the technology. And they really had that going for them. Of course, during my Nokia times, when I didn't have an iPhone, I have friends using iPhones. So coming back to the question, when they were using the, the iPhone and I tried, I was really amazed at the, the speed, how fluid the, the UI was, which is, I think, more important to most of the consumers in the perception of quality rather than uh, gimmicks like uh, changing ringtones or, mm. I don't know, MMS or, or animated GIFs or whatever at that time. So that was, uh, I think, the, 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 the industry dropped the ball there a bit in terms of giving that perception of quality to the consumers. I want to talk about then talk like design language, design philosophy, and also the way the company thinks about approaching quality to customers. If Nokia was given all the technologies that the initial iPhone had, would Nokia have launched a same product or would it have been a very different phone? What's your take? Okay. Uh, uh, let's say, let's take it hypothetically. I mean, the access to technology to, for Nokia was actually there. I mean, the access to technology was accessible to everyone in the industry. Apple did not create uh, the capacitive uh, touch screen. Apple did not create batteries. Apple did not create uh, speakers and everything. Everything was accessible to the industry. It's how they, they use it. So I think for Nokia, we have the access, but I think we, Nokia lacked that vision of having a product which can capture the imagination of the consumers. Nokia has, for, 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 for positive or negative, I mean, Nokia has a segment for every walk of life. We have, uh, we had the um, high-end $1,000 smartphones for business, for rich people. We even had the stainless steel, I think Nokia 880. I had one of that as well. It cost at that time was like 800 euros or something. It was very expensive. And we also have headphones below uh, $50. So I think the, the, the fragmentation of that market was also a disadvantage for Nokia due to the fact that we had, we, we do not have a product that people as, can aspire to because some of them was too out of reach or maybe some of them have too many compromises. So I think it was not in the culture or in the, in the mindset of uh, Nokia to have such a product like uh, an iPhone. So I think if you were, were to ask me, I think even given the access to all the technology and all the information that Apple had at the time, I still think it's very hard for Nokia to be able to do what Apple had done. It also marked the shift when hardware at that time was the more important factor for a phone than the software towards a new world where hardware and software were equally important. Yeah. So it meant that Nokia's strength of having a range of phones for everyone from high-end developed from Finland, mid-range developed in Germany, low-end developed in India, that saturation or that breath now became a potential cost or liability when it came to a world where software was a level player and you really need to optimize both hardware and software coming together. What was happening behind the scenes for the engineers? Um, yes, you, you, you are right in saying that the software really played a role in the end. I mean, at the time, uh, Symbian was really an inferior product in terms of the fragmentation because it was really hard to uh, customize the software, such an old software to newer technology, newer UI. So there were, there were, the engineers were doing a lot of hacks, trying to uh, tweak things to make it work on a, on a touchscreen surface, uh, touchscreen interface and so on. So they, uh, I think that, that fragmentation and that legacy uh, software uh, was a detrimental to how the product was being presented in the end because the, there was just, there, there's, there's just so many tweaks you can do, but in the end, the inferiority will definitely show and will definitely reflect on the, uh, when, when you are using the phone, as you can see, if you are a Symbian user at the time, 
there are so many compromises. I mean, when you click on something, some, sometimes you even need to double click, which doesn't make sense, double tap. Mm. And um, I think uh, I, I totally agree. And, in, and behind the scenes, everyone was really scrambling. I mean, we had, uh, we had task force, uh, task force and, and, and meetings and, and a lot of firefighting on trying to, to create that kind of uh, experience to the, to the customer, like what uh, iOS has. However, there's so much an engineer can do or a small team can do when the management does not have a direction. Because when we, uh, when we create something, the lack of coordination between teams can be demotivating. So we had uh, many uh, hackathons. We have uh, innovation weeks, innovation rounds. We did different kinds of UI. We presented it to the management and every and and uh, we presented internally and everything. It was it was great, but there's no. Uh, I would say I don't want to use this password, but there's no synergy. You know, like no, not no one or no entity that can unify all these in innovations into something that can be brought into a product. So I think the, the company dropped the ball there as well in packaging a compelling message or compelling vision to the customer. When you were saying that, the picture that came was like the five blind men touching the different parts of the elephant, but no one really able to piece together this whole animal. Every company faces crisis. Apple almost went bankrupt in the late 1990s. And new leadership that come in they were on the verge of bankruptcy. They dramatically refocus and reprioritize their product line. Leadership plays a very big role, as you alluded to. And Apple had both ups and downs. Talk to us about how the change in leadership in Nokia impacted the employees. Because it sounded like there were a lot of talented engineers that could have led to a more successful outcome for Nokia. So what was the disconnect between the top and everyone else in the company? I think when the change in leadership happened, there were, I would say, the, to steer that ship, the large ship, is difficult. There are different cultures. I mean, in, in the, the leadership came a lot from Finland. I mean, I was not physically in Finland, so I could not have a, 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 a feeling right on the ground there. But from what I've heard, there were a certain uh, distrust in the leadership due to the fact that the CEO that they hired later on was from Microsoft. So the, um, I think the middle management or maybe the executive suite were a bit uh, comprehensive in following through what the uh, Stephen Elop had, I mean, the CEO had Stephen Elop had on at that time. So maybe there were, there were problems there. I, I, I can't really allude to that too much because I'm not in the C-suite. But from the actions that were being implemented, uh, I could see we also lack, uh, I mean, a vision. We had, uh, we had a phone, the N, N95 or N97, if I'm not mistaken. They, they had, uh, we were actually going for the MAMO platform, which is an open source, which is also very capable. But when the, when the CEO came in, he also shoehorned the uh, Windows OS or Windows Mobile onto the, the same phone. So it, it became very confusing to the consumer, very confusing also to the teams because we are not sure, are we going this way or are we going that way? So then you see you have a lack of optimization in the resources. You have a lack of... A, uh, coordination between marketing and I mean there are a lot of confusing things and then there were the numerous reorganizations and uh, shifting of chairs around so I think uh, we could have done I mean Nokia could have done better of course if you, are, if you have a power of hindsight but the the fact that uh, there were just simply not enough urgency in the in creating a, a vision and trying to consolidate a bit the product lineup, it really, it really affected quite a bit of the, the resources and the, the, the motivation, the morale of the, the team. And then the speed of the industry 
definitely, especially uh, from, uh, from the side of uh, Android and also from the side of uh, Apple to really change the way uh, people interact with their phones. That was also a, a huge uh, contributing factor to the, the sort of, I would say, failure of Nokia uh, trying to revamp itself during the time. This process isn't an overnight thing. It takes many quarters, yeah. plays out over years. And Nokia had a really strong brand back then. Many people believe it's like a very big moat, as investors would call it. Together, BlackBerry in the corporate world, they're playing different segments, but both are very strong brands there. So Apple, for all its strengths, still had to fight really hard to, it's almost like defy gravity, like punch through the atmosphere. At what point did the Nokia team see that the iPhone had finally achieved escape velocity? That means there's no stopping them already. What signaled that to you? I can't pinpoint an exact moment, but I think when the, when the numbers showed up, when uh, we are losing market share, I think that was the time where we realized that despite the high price of an, app, of an iPhone at the time, people do aspire to own an iPhone despite the price. You, hear, you definitely heard of memes saying people selling kidneys and, and, and whatever to, to get an iPhone. I mean, that's testament yeah. to the product. Nokia's philosophy at the time was to provide an affordable, we, we don't use cheap, I mean, it's an, an affordable phone for everyone, which is noble, which is a very noble cause. I mean, not everyone can afford a high-end high -end phone, but the vision of Nokia is to connect people from every walk of life. But to see how consumer sentiments change, to have a product which people aspire to own despite the price, that was really, I think, the moment that uh, Nokia realized that it's difficult to, to catch up. It's really uh, a different mindset of the public. And also another thing for me personally, I, which I do use in my investment uh, philosophy is that I look at the net promoter score so if you have heard of it before, the NPS, in, in Nokia as well, we do a lot of NPS surveys and Apple had a, a super high NPS score, super high. Whereas in the, in the, in the Nokia phones, it was all in the mid-range. It's like, yeah, maybe I can have it, maybe, but I wouldn't really promote it to my friends. So I think that was also a signal at that time to show that uh, the, the product that Apple provide or, or Apple had at the time was really something different. It, it's almost like both players, the Nokia and iPhone, were at the different layers of the muscle hierarchy of needs, like physical needs, health, safety, connecting yeah. people, Nokia, yeah. aspirational yes. needs. This is a reflection yeah. of me, my values. Exactly, oh. yeah. And you're willing to pay a lot more for aspirations once you fulfill all the other needs in that pyramid. Yes. And here's also where I think a lot of people don't give Nokia the credit because Nokia helped get people into mobile phones, getting them comfortable with hard, good hardware, the whole concept of software, playing their first game, Snake. Yeah. And when the iPhone came in, everyone was ready to move up. If the iPhone launched in the absence of a Nokia, it's going to be a very hard adjustment for the world, potentially. You talked earlier about the Germany site closing. Can you tell us more about the day, bring that day to life when it was announced that your site would close? Okay, funnily enough, I wasn't uh, there when the all-hands meeting were being done. Because I came back from, uh, from my vacation, I proposed to my wife, really, literally, the, the weekend. Wow. Of the, that, that, that vacation, yeah. And I, when I came back, I was slightly late because I did not check my emails. So there was like an emergency email uh, going around at 7.30 a.m. So I came into the office about 9.15. So when I, when I came into the office, I saw there were like a crowd lingering outside of the building. So I was saying, did something bad happen? Was there a fire? But in the end, I saw people, some of, the, some of the ladies were in tears and most of them were a bit down. 
And one of my colleagues just came out and said, we are closed. I said, what, what do you mean closed? I mean, we, 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 we cease to exist anymore, you know, something like that. So it was, it was really, it felt there was like really something dropped in my, in my heart at the time. I, I, I couldn't uh, process it at that moment. Uh, so the emotions was there. And then uh, I started to, to compose myself and, and, and understand the, the situation. And then I went to the manager and my manager was saying that, uh, unfortunately, we, we cannot continue and uh, the, the site is going to be, to be closed soon. Uh, details are being hashed out on how, how we're going to handle everything. Then uh, after that, we, we went into the office again. We sat down. Uh, we had a small uh, meeting in our department, just answering questions and so on. Uh, there were still a lot of questions being unanswered at the time. And then uh, our team just said, okay, let's just take the day off and, and don't, don't, don't worry too much. So all of us went to the beer garden and we had a, a great time, you know, just talking and our, our business, our country, country manager, I think was quite, quite high up. She, she was also very understanding. I mean, she came to each of us each of our tables at the beer garden and, and just explain the situation and just tell us, you know, uh, don't worry. I mean, there, there are steps being done how to, how to move forward. Mm -hmm. So it was comforting. And then at the, and that day, we just ended, you know, with, uh, with drinks and, and, and just, you know, went home. So the, the, I, I broke the news then to my, to my wife and it was also quite a shock since uh, we are getting married and then I, I might not have a job in, in three months. So, <clears throat> and the next day was actually more or less business as usual. I mean, we had things to, to wrap up. We had things to, to do. So the, 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 the three months after that was quite eventful. We had a lot of uh, job counseling sessions. We had uh, job fairs. Uh, our team, our, the HR arranged for different companies to come in. And then they, the HR put out the news that there are a lot of uh, talents here. So BMW came and uh, hired a lot of our software developers and they even took over one of the building's leases, which was great I mean, for them. Then we also had, uh, for, for my side, uh, Continental came in. They wanted to hire a team with experience in uh, mechanical uh, design. So we were perfect for that. Uh, Continental just acquired a startup which were doing the autonomous driving uh, sensors. They did cameras, radar, LiDAR, infrared. So the sensors were basically like small electronic devices as well. So there's a, there's a plastic cover, there's a PCB in between and there are antennas, radar and everything, which, which is perfect for what our team provided at the time, Nokia. So uh, we were fortunate to be interviewed by them. And most of my colleagues, my team just moved over to, to Coninta and they even rented half of the building. So uh, that was great for, for the transition that, that my team had. And to the other colleagues, most of them moved on to also the car industry. And we were fortunate also that Daimler was just next door. So Daimler also took uh, a bit of us there. One thing to highlight that Nokia did very well as well is that they, they, gave, uh, they gave grants for people to start up. So, I mean, that was really un, unheard of for me from my experience to give just money to people to start their own business. So, I know at least two of my colleagues who took up the offer and they are doing well for themselves. So, that was great. This is a testament first to Nokia who organized all this and also to the employees like yourself because you clearly had skills that were sought after in the industry. And Germany has a huge automotive industrial base. So as we close this chapter in Nokia, what were your personal learnings and takeaways for your entire experience on what happened? I would take this as a lesson to, I mean, if you are talking about career, don't, uh, don't stand still. You have to really uh, improve yourself as, as time goes on and, and, be, and have a pulse on the, in the industry from, from bottom to the top. I mean, as if you are in management or if you are in the executive suite, it's way more important to understand the, the industry. 
And if you're talking from a career-wise, let's say as an engineer or everything, you know, you, you have to, I, I, I've learned that uh, we really need to improve ourselves to get to know what is happening and to provide that value to the company and make yourself heard. Because it's not just enough to just uh, create things, but it's not being implemented. So that could be a, a difficult thing. I mean, I'm also learning at, at that time how to show that value because if, if it's a very big company, there are definitely hierarchies and bureaucracy that you may not have that kind of freedom as easily as, as, as what you think to bring your to bring your value to be shown. So that's what that's learned that's a learning that I have I have uh, from that that chapter of my life. And I also put it back into what I'm doing now as, as an investor to to keep a pulse on the industry in trends and do not dismiss too early uh, the disruptors in the industries. For many of us who are working in corporate roles, our view or perspective of industry can be distorted by the information we receive from our own companies. We go to yes. weekly all hands, management meetings, we read our newsletters. So we have a certain perception of industry that is from our company. What's one tip you have for our viewers in today's generation in keeping an objective pulse of the industry? Yeah, it's very interesting that you say that because in, in Nokia as well, we have like information sessions between, uh, between sites and, and business units about uh, the outlook of the industry. I think for uh, an employee or an engineer or even in the middle management or whatever in, in the company, if you can ask what makes the competitor's product really compelling as well. Don't just think that whatever you hear from the annual reports or any internal uh, newsletters that our products are going to compete to this, compete to that. But also, you know, sometimes maybe just uh, going out and, and trying the competitors' products, uh, asking uh, just simple questions like, why do you think you buy this instead of buying it? Or if they are buying that? Mm. And what makes you buy this? I mean, why? why? You know, ask the why questions. And I, I think even in many co any companies, they do break down the competitors' products. They do analyze all those uh, competitors' products. But I think maybe instead of just relying on the information that is uh, coming from another internal party, you, you, know, you do it yourself. You know? Now, now in, in current times, YouTube is, is so prevalent nowadays. I mean, if you just click on YouTube and try to find a review of any product, there's definitely one out there. So take that as a feedback to improve yourself, to improve your, your company, to improve your, your work in the product and try to make yourself heard now. because I think that's an, an important issue as well because some, some companies do not provide that avenue for, for engineers or for a small team to say, hey, let's change this and do this. So it's a, it's a culture that has to be cultivated in the company to, have, to make yourself heard. So you have to try to find that, that way, uh, however it is. I hear a big takeaway to step out of our own zone or comfort zone and hear different perspectives, whether it's talking to consumers or going on digital platforms. Recently in Volkswagen's leadership meeting, the CEO Herbert Dees also brought Elon Musk to speak with the top yeah. management team as well. That would have been pretty shocking or rare for most companies, I imagine. All companies. I think it was very rare to have a competitor. I mean, imagine if Nokia were to invite Steve Jobs and, and come in and, and, and talk about how to change the company. I mean, you will never, never, never go through them. I think if you were to say, if, if I, I, I was not part of a, a, a large uh, auto manufacturer in Germany, but we do, when I was in Continental, we do provide, uh, we do work closely with them. So we do have a, a bit of a, a, an inkling of how they work. I think what the Herbert Dees did is really unconventional, really uh, disruptive. I think that's the message that he wants to show to, the, to his uh, executives. I mean, don't, don't uh, stand too high on the, on the, on the platform or, or, or on the peak and, and feel that no one can reach you because you, 
you just need to be humble and, and to accept the reality that someone somewhere is going to disrupt your comfortable zone. And I hope that the message will go through those executives. From what I see, it's a tough hill to climb for VW. It's really a tough hill to climb. I mean, years of ingrained culture, years of uh, being comfortable. I mean, if you look at the body language of the executives in that meeting, I don't think it will be a big impact. But I hope that Herbert Dees really can, can change because if you were to talk about a real big impact, I think VW can do a big impact since they are, they are, their skill, uh, their volumes are 10, 20 times of, of, of what Tesla can do. So it, it's, it's great for the industry as a whole. I mean, uh, transitioning to, to more sustainable energy, we, need, uh, we, we cannot just rely on, a, on, a, on just one uh, entity or even on just one person. So we need a, a mindset change among everyone. Talking about change, just as we shifted industries from Nokia to continental and automotive industry. Now let's shift from talking about Nokia's and iPhones to the automotive industry, because many people are curious about what this means for Tesla. Some people see Tesla as an iPhone moment that we just talked about in this interview. What similarities do you see with Tesla's rise and iPhone's rise? And what differences could there be that people may not be noticing? I would first say that I'm a Tesla shareholder. So I have a pretty big, good picture on, on what Tesla is doing and also the advantage of being in Nokia when, when iPhone uh, disrupted the, the industry. So just talk, taking parallels between these two events, I would say the, the vision, I mean, the vision really or the mission really gives a big impact to, to the to the company or to the industry and also the belief of the colleagues, I mean, the employees towards their vision. That's also very important. I mean, like if you look at VW, the CEO says that they want to change, but if there's no belief coming from the employees that he, he, he as a person cannot do much because we as humans, we know when you are just giving something rhetoric rather than putting into action. So I hope that there will be the change there. And uh, if you were to say how, what else does Tesla have that uh, can draw parallels towards that moment, I would say the agility and the, the speed of the, the pace of innovation that Tesla provides, it's really unprecedented. I think I would even say that Tesla is faster than Apple, even at the iPhone times. Wow. That's saying a lot because a phone and a car are two completely different things. The level of complexity is a factor more. Yes. What differences would you say there are to this analogy? Sometimes we use analogies to oversimplify things for the brain to process it. But mm. being in an industry, both in the Nokia side and automotive world, you have a little bit more nuance in this. Yeah. I think the difference is that Tesla is not afraid to, to fail in terms of uh, trying new things. If you were to look really in the differences, Apple started off with really a product that has, that actually not perfect. It was really not perfect, but they, they perfected the part that was the, having the most impact. So that, that was what they did. Uh, Tesla, to a certain extent, also was not perfect. I mean, if you see how they manufacture, but they were very quick in, in owning that. They were very quick in, in changing that. Whereas uh, if you are looking in the operation side, Apple was more a demander. They demand their suppliers to provide a certain uh, quality to them, and they are not afraid to spend. So they, and they also changed a bit of the, the way business was done. And that was also the similarities of uh, Tesla. But Tesla was more towards, Tesla is more towards um, the, I would say the, 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 the pace. I would say really the pace. They, they are not afraid to say that, to be different. They are not afraid to, uh, Tesla is not afraid to say that if you cannot do it, I, then I will do it instead of 
Apple, if you cannot do it, I'll pay you to do it. So it's a bit mm-hmm. different. In, in, in Nokia times, we, we had a lot of partnerships with our suppliers. The phones were built uh, by, the, by Foxconn. So there were, it's a totally different way of working because in, it's more of like a risk, risk spreading. So we give a bit of risk to the uh, suppliers as well for, for Nokia. But Apple is in a different, at that time, they, they change it in the sense that they, they own the manufacturing risk. So they buy the machines because when, when Apple said, okay, I want you to do this aluminum cover, which you need a special machine or what, sometimes the supplier will say, I, I, with your volumes, I cannot do it because it's not worth my time, not worth my money. But Apple will say, no, I'll give you the money. I buy the machine. You just do it. So that's what that's a different mindset. So Nokia mm-hmm. was a bit different. It's like do this, then you say, oh, I cannot do this. The supplier may say, uh, it's not 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 at this price. Can you change it a bit? You know, then, then there's the compromise there. So I think Apple was that, but Tesla was is going it a bit further. It's saying that you can't do this. I'll do it myself. So that's maybe why I say that the the speed is way faster, and they keep the knowledge. Uh, more or less, they learn faster than, than what Apple has done. To add to your point, what made Apple different when they launched the iPhone was that they had about seven, eight years of su- profits from the successful iMac relaunches, the iPod launches. So yeah. that gave them a revenue and also profit in the cash base to, in your mm. words, like buy the suppliers, give them the, yeah. the equipment that yes. Whereas for Tesla, they launched with the Model S, that the X, and they, were, they had no scale, they had no existing lines of business that were profitable yet. So it was really almost like sheer necessity and will they had to do mm. what they had to do. Yes, I, I totally agree. I mean, if you look deeper into the, the, how the, the, the industry works, uh, the car seats in, in, in the world it's actually mainly just being done by two, two companies, two supplies. If I'm not mistaken, just two and maybe some smaller players. But, you know, when, when you are a startup like Tesla, when you want to make a car seat, it's either you buy or you do it yourself. If you can't buy, because, not because of no money, it's because that your volumes are so small that it's not worth the effort of the supplier to say, okay, I built and designed a, a car seat for you. So, and that, that is why you see, if you are a Tesla shareholder, you definitely know that Tesla makes their own seats, which, is, which, is, which no car company in the world will, will, will do. Uh, it's just not in that culture, or maybe it's not in, just, not in the, the way that, that they, they do things. Uh. If Tesla at that time were to say, okay, I'm not going to do the car seat, but just give me a price and do it for me, that would maybe even ruin them financially because the, the price of, you know, just a thousand car seats is totally, will, will, will make your profits just be zero just because of the car seats. So I think Tesla did a very good job in, in, in also same, the, the same like what Apple did, I mean, to change what makes the real impact to the customer because the main interface of a driver to the car is the butts, right? I mean, you sit on the, on the chair. So that is one of the things that the first thing that a customer will feel when they, when they own a car. So I think they, they did very well there and they prioritized what they can do and they did it very well. And those that they can compromise for the meantime, they, they compromise it a bit and, and improve as, as time goes on. All of these actions, as you alluded to earlier, isn't just a CEO's vision that is enough, but you need the team to execute who are fully and truly bought in. So talent is a long-term determinant for a company's success. Like how Apple and Nokia used to be great talent magnets for engineers. What is Tesla's reputation as an employer to those in the automotive industry? The thing is I left the industry in 2015. So I do not, uh, like I can't really give much of an opinion there. Tesla got really visible, I mean, in the past three or four years. It was really, wasn't really visible during that time, but it was already being talked about in our industry when I was in Continental. I do have just short interfaces with, with the Tesla team. Uh, I did not personally uh, work with them, but I helped a colleague who were interfacing with Tesla. So at that time, they were doing the Model 3, but at that time, it was not 
known as a Model 3 app, they were asking for the long-range uh, radar mm -hmm. at that time. So Continental provided that, that radar for them, the ARS uh, 400, if I'm not mistaken. But it's, it's public already, lah, so it's okay. That time, uh, from what I've heard from my colleague who was interfacing with them, the, the volumes were very small. So the company, I mean, Continental was not very open to making too many changes for them. So they were asking uh, Tesla, G, just, just take what we have. If you want to buy, you know, just take what we have. We are not going to put too much engineering effort in it. For, and from what I've heard from that colleague was that uh, Tesla was very accepting. I mean, they, they know that they, they, they are not able to push too much changes to the, to the product by itself. And they take a lot of uh, effort to, to provide the uh, engineering knowledge or, or, or the requirements that they have and to, to do the changes themselves instead of relying on the suppliers. So I think uh, that was one of the most impactful or, or maybe exchanges that I had in the time that I have. Uh, it's just, just, just a small thing. And then I, I left the industry, so uh, I can't really allude too much on, on what's happening after that. But it's, it's heartening to know that they do did use the, the radar that, that we provided. So, but, and then now, you know, they, they removed it. So <laughs> it's cool, I mean, to, to, to have that short exchange to know what, what is happening. One, even that experience working in them, that small piece, give you a sense of just the, the yeah. level of uh, determination and problem solving skills to go overcome tough challenges and not being mm. put down by that. And second, yeah. Kelvin, it sounds like you played in your own way, a role in putting a radar into the Tesla Model 3 in the early days. While, while Tesla isn't using radar today, the radar in the first few years helped give them the confidence to build up their yeah. co-pilot self-driving system. It is a journey. So that's huge credit to you and the team. <laughs> no one, one individual yeah. does it, but it's a huge team of people. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't, yeah, like I said, I wasn't uh, specifically interfacing with Tesla, but of course, uh, the, the person, the, the sales, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was a sales or marketing. I don't, I'm not sure what, who, what's his role anymore, but um, he was not asking like feedback on, on what can we provide to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to this customer, I mean, to Tesla. It was great. I mean, at that time, I didn't expect Tesla to be that big. I mean, it was just a customer, right, at that time. But to, to, to have the impact, I mean, to, to reflect it back and, and to feel that of all the customers, I mean, that was so. That was the memorable one that I remember. It was really uh, different because we had. I mean, our big customers were like Toyota, like Volkswagen, where they can just say, "Okay, we'll buy a million, we'll buy two million units." So that was definitely the main bulk of our job. But to have such a memorable impact, I think it was also fate in the sense that uh, I happened to 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 realize the potential of Tesla to be just a small part. It was also quite quite a, a bit, maybe not much of a part but it was uh it was it was cool yeah it is very cool i'm a big fan of of that thank you for sharing that story when we were talking earlier about nokia and the symbian operating system because there were so many sunk costs you call it a sunk cost policy it was harder for nokia to embrace a new operating system type that was in a touchscreen first world today in the automotive industry we're seeing a similar transition Traditional legacy automakers have huge sunk costs and manufacturing base on internal combustion engine vehicles. It's not that they don't know how to build EVs or they don't know who to call like Idra Group to buy a Giga mm. Press. But the mindset is I need to optimize my assets, my equipment, my depreciation, and that is stopping them from making that shift. What is your take on what's going on in the automotive industry? Paralleling with your prior experience in Nokia. Yes, I think I'm. I'm firstly, I'm not a business major, so I'm. I'm not really uh, well versed in in uh, in trying to optimize capex and everything. But I think the the psychology or the the, the culture of the sunk cost. I think it's it's very real. It's very real. In if you are if you are drawing parallels to what I why what I said uh, about Symbian. It's very hard to convince sometimes the managers or the, the business team that was in the in that in that uh was that was responsible for that product 
to, to give it up. So I think that is also what is happening in the automotive industry. I mean, you are talking about the transmission team, the fuel pump, the fuel system, the, the engines, you know, the thermodynamics. It, they, they, they're going to lose their jobs, definitely. It is actually the management or rather the vision of the company to tell these people or tell these talents that you have to transition. I'm sure a good company will not just let go of these people, but they should sit down and tell them that apply these skills to the newer product. I mean, if you are talking about, let's say, transmission, there can be a transmission in the, in the electric model, in the, in the powertrain. It's just how you use it. The Taycan has a two-gear gearbox. So it, it's, it's not saying that you were totally, I mean, a fuel pump, let's say a fuel pump is gone, but your knowledge of pumps can go into the heat pump. Your knowledge of pumps can go into the, the, the cooling. So I think the decision has to come really from the management themselves. I think uh, you should explain to the shareholders, you should explain to the stakeholders that we have invested quite a lot of money in, in these certain uh, technologies, but because the industry is changing, we have to write it off uh, in a, I mean, the business sense, you know, to write it off to, to say that we have to look further rather than look backwards and, and, and being stuck with something that is not going to grow in the future. It's not easy because the, uh, the market share of EVs are still, is still small. There's still a market for the normal international combustion. They definitely still have to provide that. Otherwise, they cannot just give up that, that revenue. But they have to be clear in their, in their message. They really have to be clear in the message and not to give a mixed message that saying that we will still do ICE, we will still do EVs, we will still do hydrogen, we will still do nuclear fusion or whatever. So there, there must be, there must be a, a vision, uh, something that all the, the whole company can work towards while uh, transitioning so they can still continue what they are selling now, you know, doing the fuel pumps or, or, or engines, but moving towards the, the newer technology. I think that that could be, should be the, 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 the way forward rather than still giving that, that illusion that we will still stay in this uh, technology. It may be politically incorrect, you know, some, some managers, they definitely won't, won't say that your job is going to be gone in five years, but Sometimes the reality can come faster than, than, than you imagine. Yes. The so saying that the truth will first piss you off, then it will mm. set you free. And yeah. you're able to think objectively. Your earlier point on having a pulse of the industry and not just looking at what we want to see. As we come to a close, mm. we've seen Nokia's journey, its rise and its fall. And we've seen other companies like Apple rising in the time, but even as a company rises, it is not easy. When someone's a disruptor, it's like the iPhones, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they criticize you, they deny you, they try to block you. At the very end, when everyone has to accept you, they accept you. Where is Tesla today in that journey? I think there is still a long way to go for Tesla. It's still not being acceptable in, in many mindsets because I think they still think that Tesla is a premium brand. I mean, it's, it's for good or for bad, it's still, they say it's a premium brand. I think the time that <clears throat> Tesla will be acceptable to most of the people is coming. So, you know, like, like the iPhone moment, like, like what I said just now. I mean, people aspire to, to own a Tesla. Even if you say uh, Tesla is expensive, right? But if you are going to buy an EV, mm -hmm. if you type EV in Google, you will definitely have Tesla among the search results. So you can't deny the fact that the brand is synonymous with electric vehicles. I think if you were to say the trajectory, I mean, Tesla still have 
still has a long a, a ways to go. They, they still can grow. I mean, I'm not I'm not talking about the, the share price. I'm not talking about its valuation. That is another topic. But if you are just talking as a business, they are just in the early stages. I mean, they're making a million a year. A million a year is, is nothing compared to how much the, the industry is, is doing every year. And if you look at the, the so many markets are still untapped. I mean, just across the border from Malaysia is Singapore. You see, you, you, you are just starting to, to, to get uh, Teslas officially in, uh, I think in July, right? Yes. And just across the border, Malaysia, there's no, no Teslas. I mean, very small amounts. So there's still a lot of potential for Tesla to come in. And if what the, the management has in store or, or plan to do, and if they can execute it well, I think Tesla is maybe in just the teenage years. They, they still have a long way to go. They still have a lot of things to grow. Agree. And we contrast industries. While well, iPhone had a meteoric rise, it took them still about five years. And the mobile phone replacement cycle is once every three to five years. Yeah. The automotive replacement cycle will be once every 10 years on average. Seven. I would say seven. Seven years. So it's going to yeah. take a longer time to play out. And there are way more cars right now than when iPhone launched their smartphones. So yes. it's going to be a long journey ahead. Maybe I add a bit. The, the lifetime of a car is uh, totally different like, in, uh, like a mobile phone. So a, a, car will, a car is designed to at least last 10 years. But the industry is, uh, is working on a seven-year product cycle. I'm not sure now, but in, uh, in, during my time, 2015, it was really in a seven years. They, they, they developed something for seven years ahead. But Tesla is also changing that. I mean, they, 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 they don't do facelifts. They, they just do ongoing changes. So we don't know. They might cause the consumer to, to rethink that seven-year or 10-year cycle. And they might even change it faster. So we'll see. <laughs> yes. That sounds like an exciting topic to do a Tesla deep dive in a future face-to-face -face episode. Hoping to make a trip to, to KL soon. Kelvin, thank you for sharing your stories, giving us the look from inside Nokia, a perspective that we don't often read about or hear a lot about. And thank you for your, your words of wisdom and all the great small nuggets of stories, whether it's the, the way Nokia's culture was really good for an employees, the way they took care of you even when the site closed in Germany, and your small indirect story of small influence in getting the radar into the Tesla Model 3 in those early days. If you found this video insightful, inspiring, useful, please click the like button. And hit subscribe to stay updated to more videos like this. Thank you for watching and take care.